great to be here. Definitely feels like coming home. I did my dissertation work at Duke um, in the ecology programs with the Nicholas School of the Environment, the bi biology department, and then also under the fearless leadership of Ann Yoder, and worked with a number of different people at the Lemur Center who were fantastic resources for me. So it's wonderful to be back. Um, and I want to thank Ann and everybody at the Lemur Center for all the work that they did for pulling this symposium together. I think it's an outstanding group of speakers and just so inspiring to get everybody together in one room. So I think Feedy set me up really well here <laughs> with all of the One Health background. I wanted to focus particularly on the environmental angle. So talking about how environmental change has impacted Madagascar over the past 1,000 plus years, and then also talk about how that environmental change impacts lemurs and beyond. So we all know that Madagascar is a very special place. Um, otherwise, we probably wouldn't even be in this room. And we all know that, that uh, it's one of the hottest of the biodiversity hotspots where levels of species endemism is anywhere from 85 to 100% across different taxa. It's also a conservation priority because of the rates of deforestation that put that diversity at risk. And, and I would argue that a, the landscape diversity that we see in Madagascar has played an important role in the development of the biodiversity that we see there. Yet, Madagascar has, has definitely had tremendous impact from humans, and I would say that the, the, um, that environmental change also plays a role in, in how the biodiversity story has played out as well, so in particular the megafauna extinction. And so I'll be focusing today on, especially on how environmental change has occurred throughout Madagascar, quick, quick review of that, and then talk um, in depth, more depth about how environmental change impacts lemur health. So first I'll talk a little bit about how do we even measure that, how do we measure lemur health and see a change. Um, and then I'll talk about two different case studies. The first being a, a, a study that we, um, that we conducted looking at two different populations of injury, one at a, at a more disturbed, exposed site and one at a more pristine site. And then also look at the potential impact that climate change, so really large scale environmental change might have on parasites of lemurs and ultimately their, their health and fitness as well. And then also put a, a plug for One Health Approaches and think beyond lemurs to everybody else who lives in Madagascar and beyond. So we are in a particularly interesting time period. We've seen massive political and cultural um, changes and, it's, and very importantly, environmental changes. And so uh, there's been a call for calling the, uh, the, the time period since the 18th century the Anthropocene. And the Anthropocene has been characterized very much by, by population growth, by urbanization, by globalization. And so, and that's been very much driven by, by increasing population growth, natural resource use. So both from a subsistence livelihood standpoint, as well as more large scale um, forest uh, logging, mining, et cetera. Um, there's also been an, an increased demand for meat, uh, over 50% increased demand for meat worldwide. So that causes um, quite a bit of, of environmental change as well in transitioning forest landscapes to, uh, to grassland. And we can start to look at how humans have really influenced um, our environments and our world. Uh, looking, this is a, at the Human Influence Index. So it's a, a composite index that's looking at population density of humans, at our transportation networks, at um, different measures of urbanization. And when we zoom into Madagascar, we see that there, there is quite a bit of a very extensive influence of, of humans in Madagascar. The warmer colors here in this map indicate areas where there is a lot more human influence. Um, so, and again, that's population, human population density and transportation networks and infrastructure and urbanization. So you see that there aren't that many places in Madagascar where we have a, a fairly low level of human influence. And this is not necessarily just a recent phenomenon. In fact, um, a really interesting paper came out this year where they were looking at, um, at when in, in Madagascar's history we see a shift in, in, environment, in, in the typical environment in Madagascar. And using um, samples from stalagmites and caves, they've been able to look at the, the carbon, uh, the stable isotope information. And about 890 to 990 CE, they see a dramatic shift in that signal. And so that's indicative that um, there was actually a major shift from uh, forest to grassland. And there's also an increasing signal of the use of fire. And so they were hypothesizing that during that time period, so more than 1,000 years ago, humans really started using fire as a tool to transition forest landscape into grassland landscape. 
to, to, um, for, for cattle grazing, essentially. So it's, it's not a, a, mo a more recent phenomenon, but this has been happening for, for many years in Madagascar and, and definitely has an influence on, on diversity in Madagascar. So in more recent time periods, we definitely see, I would say over the last 50 years or so, there's been an increasing, a more dramatic increase in the, in the level of environmental change. And much of this has been driven by population growth rates. So Madagascar has one of the highest population growth rates in the world of, at over 3%. And the majority of people living in Madagascar do rely on subsistence livelihood. So they're using natural resources for food sources, um, agriculture, charcoal production, um, building, et cetera. There are also large-scale environmental and natural resources extraction activities going on as well, so mines and logging. And the impact of this type of activity, we've, um, we've seen quite a lot of forest loss in, in Madagascar. So there's some controversy over, to, over the exact extent of forest primary forest in Madagascar originally, but at least from the 1950 to 2000 time period, it's been well documented that uh, we've seen over 40% reduction in, in total forest cover. And if you're thinking about the primary forest, so those core forest fragments that, that are over a kilometer um, from the edge, we've seen more than 80% reduction. And so it's about more than almost 1% per year. And this, um, these rates are definitely higher than we see in other regions in the U.S. And I just wanted to call out one, um, one area. That we, we looked specifically at, at um, distributions of, of the rosewood species, so Dalbergia, um, tree species that's found throughout Madagascar. And what we did was we took uh, their presence locations, we modeled where we think they probably were um, existed historically. So we compared historic distributions to what we see, um, what we expect to see in current distributions based on forest distribution and the presence of logging. And what we found was that anywhere from 54 to 98 percent reduction from historic to current distributions. So we're seeing that across the board in, in many different species, but it, it certainly will have a large impact on, on wildlife, on humans, and, and others. And so I'm, I'm going to quickly walk through some of the larger impacts as a result of some of this habitat loss and forest loss. One is erosion. So Madagascar has, um, I believe it's seven times as high ero or as erosion rates when compared to other places in the, in, in the world. Um, and it's somewhere along the lines of 400 tons a year of sediment are going down through the rivers. And it's actually so distinct that it's visible from space. Um, I, I read that some astronauts um, sort of describe this scene as, as almost like Madagascar is ble bleeding out of its very iron-rich red soils bleeding out through its rivers. And this plays an important role for for wildlife and humans as well because the, the soil um, erosion causes soil depletion and so very important nutrients are lost from the soil. So this makes the soil less productive for agriculture, uh, for the people living on the soil as well as, um, as, well as for natural habitats and, uh, and, and when you have a, a de decrease in the forest cover you also see increasing erodification. And when you are cutting the forest, we also see invasive species that come back into the cut areas. And so that, that can completely change the species combination, or composition in, a, in an area and then impacts those, um, those wildlife species that rely upon those food resources. So you see a lot of change um, in these habitats. And unfortunately, it takes quite a long time to recover from this type of, of habitat loss. Um, anywhere from up to 100 years for a forest to be able to resemble what the original uncut forest would look like. And actually, when you, when you um, come to think about invasive species and recultivation with other species, it may never actually return to the original composition. So that's the local impact. Globally, the, the impact of deforestation and more slash and burn agriculture type of techniques contributes about 12% to gre global greenhouse gases. Um, I read that it, one day of deforestation is equivalent in carbon footprint to about 8 million people taking a flight um, around the world to New York City. And so speaking of greenhouse gases, um, climate change is certainly going to have an effect and has already started to have an effect in, in Madagascar. Um, there's supposed to be additional warming throughout the country, um, more erodification in the south, and then also increasing precipitation. 
And we're also expected to see more intense storms, so extreme storm events like cyclones throughout the country. So when you, um, when you think about the, the, the people who live in underdeveloped infrastructure and having these extreme events come through, they're going to be deal dealing with flooding um, and additional mortality and, and food security risk. And lastly, we also see that this habitat, and habitat loss and fragmentation increases vulnerability of, of lemurs to hunting. We've, um, over the past five, 10 years, have started to see the emergence of a bushmeat market. Um, and so the consumption of bushmeat and the potential risk for disease transmission between and among um, humans and, and wildlife and um, domestic animals is, is something that needs to be addressed. So I'm glad Feedy's working on that. <laughs> So that was the quick tour of environmental change in Madagascar. Now I want to focus on how this change impacts um, lemur health. And to really, actually before I get there, um, so habitat loss definitely has an impact on species survival. Um, so fragmentation can isolate populations. It reduces habitat quality and food resources. It, as I mentioned, it increases risk of hunting and non-native emergence. Um, over 90% of Madagascar's endemic species live within these, within these restricted forest areas. So um, quite a lot of the endemic biodiversity relies on these forests. Recently, the IUCN deemed that 94% of lemur species are currently at risk for survival. What I want to focus on today is not necessarily survival, but in thinking about lemur health. And as I mentioned, I was fortunate to do my, my work here with all of the resources at the Lemur Center. Um, and so we did, um, I was able to collaborate with a, a very broad group of collaborators to do health evaluations on different lemurs throughout the country. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So I worked with the Prosimian Biomedical Survey Project, which was a project that was started by Randy Youngie in about 2000, um, and it involves vets and, and researchers from all over the world, including Malagasy vets and, and researchers. And um, it started really as, as sort of an opportunistic way to, um, when an animal was being captured, they would do a health evaluation while it was down. But then it really became more intentional to try to sample across many of the different sites in Madagascar to capture that signal of, of the habitat diversity in different climate regions and also levels of, of anthropogenic disturbance. So, so far they've, um, when I worked with this data set, it had over 700 different lemurs across 13 different species, and that number has, has certainly increased. Um, so we worked with very, uh, very qualified vets, what we would do for, for lemur capture is we would oftentimes dart them out of trees from a fairly close range. So as the anesthetic would start to take um, effect in the lemur, the lemur would loosen its grip on the tree and we had to have a team ready to capture the lemur as it fell. So, but once we had the lemur in hand, we were able to collect an incredible amount of information from each individual lemur. So we, we did morphological measurements, taking height and weight. We evaluated each individual to look at um, the amount of skin fat they had, what their coat was looking like, what their teeth condition um, was like looking at um, for the presence of, of any external wounds. And then we also took a number of different samples. So we took blood samples that could be used for genetic analyses to look at blood parasites, um, to also evaluate immune response in each individual lemur and do a variety of vitamin and mineral panels. We took samples of ectoparasites, so looking for what types of um, mites and lice and ticks that were on each individual lemur. We also took fecal samples um, and uh, to look at gastrointestinal parasite richness, and we took skin samples also for genetic analyses. So it's quite a lot of work, but um, over this time period, so across the PBSP and through other studies, hundreds and hundreds of parasite samples, they've documented over 88 unique parasites, and that's probably even more um, now. But through our data collection, we had the, the type, the lemur species that it was, that each par parasite was found in the individual, as well as the geographic location and the prevalence of that parasite within the population studied. So there's much more work to be done as well. Okay, so that's how we evaluated health among lemurs. So I wanted to now turn towards one of the case studies that I wanted to present, which is really looking at the effects of environmental change on two different injury pop populations. So injury are fascinating animals. They're the largest of the lemurs. They're critically endangered, as defined by the IUCN. Um, so they're one of the most endangered lemurs, or primates, really, on the planet. They are also one of the loudest 
uh, mammals on Earth. So I, I do have a short clip that I wanted to share with you. I couldn't resist sharing it. This was a clip that I took early one morning when we went into the, to the field to start to collect samples. And there was um, an injury calling to his group. If I can get it to play. You can imagine it continues, but it's just this eerily magical um, sound um, in the forest. So what we did was we wanted to compare these two different populations of, of injury. So uh, we compared at a more exposed site versus a more pristine site. So the sites we chose were Analamazocha for, Forest Complex, where we sampled 16 different injury. Um, and, and Batampanas Strict Nature Reserve, where we sampled 20. And so Analamazotra is an interesting site. It's, uh, there are, it's more exposed, so there's, there's habitat, or, or people are living right around the park. It's only about two hours from the capital city of Tana, so it's a really convenient park to get to for tourists. So they have um, as many as 30,000 tourists visit the park every single year, and they all want to come and, and see the lemurs. So there's a much higher exposure to, to humans in this park. Um, and just five kilometers down the road from, from this area is the largest nickel mine in the, in the world was put in um, s uh, several years ago. Um, so there, there was some um, degradation associated with that as well. And then Batampana Strict Nature Reserve is a more, pro more protected site. So it's a, um, it was originally protected in 1927 and then was given the designation of Strict Nature Reserve in 1966. And so that means that only research activities are, are allowed in the park. So it means that no tourism is allowed. So it definitely has a lower human exposure. And, and since 1990, the Madagascar Fauna and Flora Group have been act, very active in the park, um, doing environmental education programs around the park with the local villages and, and, and also doing research. So they've been a very positive presence in the area um, and detriment and, and um, has been able to stop um, any illegal, well, some illegal activity, logging activity. So we um, per compared these two populations, and even with this small sample, we saw pretty striking differences. And so what we did see was that those lemurs, the injury that were in the more exposed site, so Analamazocha, where there's more human exposure and more environmental change, we saw a significant impairment in their health across a number of different parameters. So we looked at um, nutritional parameters, immune response, as well as parasite richness. So we saw an elevated immune response in the exposed population, so as, as measured by leukocyte count and differential. We saw lower nutritional parameters across 12 different measures, um, including protein. We also saw elevated levels of, of nickel and cobalt and a number of other metals in the exposed site, also very close to the nickel mine. Um, and then we also saw elevated parasite richness in the exposed site and a, and a significantly higher prevalence of lice. And so this suggests that um, the, the greater anthropogenic disturbance and habitat degradation of the exposed site may be influencing the physiological state of these lemurs and perhaps even be associated with a, a higher, so more susceptibility to parasite infection, leading to the, the higher parasite richness. So. There we go. Okay, so that was case study number one, and then I also wanted to share a second uh, project that I worked on, which is was trying to, to think about how, the, how climate change, so large-scale environmental change, may influence um, the health of lemurs um, in the future. So climate change is predicted to affect Madagascar, and some argue that it already has. Um, we're looking, it's expected to, to have 1.1 to 2.6 degrees um, Celsius increase in temperature throughout the country, especially within the southwest, which is already the most arid region. Um, and then also uh, increased precipitation throughout the country as well, except in that southern region too. So we're going to see increased aridification in the south, but also increased um, precipitation elsewhere. And so why does this matter for lemurs and for lemur health? Um, well, some argue that, that climate change actually has already started to impact lemur um, survival and, and fitness. 
but I'm going to focus today on how it may impact lemur parasites, and which would, um, would impact fitness in, in a long-term um, time scale. So many parasites, as Feedy alluded to, have environmental stages or can persist, persist in the environment for, for a long time or for varying amounts of time. With the anticipated warming and the precipitation that we see, there could be, um, we could see faster reproduction and longer transmissibility, so longer, longer and more viable um, time periods in, the, in environmental reservoirs, as well as more microhabitats for, for larva. So that means that um, with a longer environmental transmissibility, it means that there could be the chance of um, more hosts coming by, some more lemurs, as well as other types of hosts, domestic animals, rodents, or humans that could potentially be exposed. So for this project, we um, utilized the Prosimian Biomedical Survey Project data set as well, where I mentioned we had 20 different sites um, throughout Madagascar that had been sampled. To, we wanted to add some additional um, di diversity of our sampling, and so we also looked to a more historical record. Um, so we turned to the archives of the Institute Pasteur. And so the Pasteur Institute has been active in Madagascar since 1898, and they actually probably are one of the earliest adopters of the One Health approach. They sent teams out throughout the country to, to sample humans, um, lemurs, livestock, cattle, birds, reptiles, you name it. If it moved, they probably sampled it. And they took meticulous records, and so we went back. I, I went to a dusty off-site location on Duke's campus and uh, dug through some of these records and found these paper records of, of um, parasites documented in lemurs. And it's a great thing that parasite names are the same in English and in French because all of the records were in French. But we were able to, through this work, add an additional 18 different sites, locations of, of lemur parasites documented. And so from all of that data, we whittled down to really focus on just six parasites. And so we, we focused on those parasites that um, were most frequently documented in lemurs and then also had the most potential for sort of chronic pathogenic effect. And so we looked at four helminths, or parasitic worms, as well as two ectoparasites, so parasites found on the outside of the body. And so helminths, um, parasitic worms, um, can, they don't have, well, first it's been rather understudied in lemurs, especially relative to other primate um, parasites. So there's more work to be done. But um, they tend not to have a sort of immediate acute effects. It's more of a chronic infection, um, sublethal effects. So it, it can be somewhat subtle and difficult to detect, but they will have um, impacts on lemur fitness over time. So they can lead to dehydration, weight loss, and reduce fitness. Then ectoparasites also, they're fairly widespread, they're difficult to get rid of. Um, they can cause uh, skin reactions, elevated immune response, but I think most interesting about ectoparasites is that they can serve as a, a really important vector for potential other infections like plague or typhus. And so we wanted to know, well, what environmental conditions, where, where, do these, where could these um, parasites live in lemur populations throughout Madagascar, and how are they related to the environmental conditions and where they live? So we combined our lemur parasite data, database with um, a, a set of environmental covariates. So we looked at um, 19 different bioclimatic variables, temperature and precipitation, as well as different characteristics um, of the land, so geology, soil, solar radiation, slope and aspect. And we used, um, so we started, we, we took each individual parasite presence uh, location and, and were able to extract the environmental conditions present at, at that location. So we essentially learned um, what types of environmental conditions these parasites thrived in. And then we were able to use species distribution models to then predict, based on what we know about their environmental preferences, where might these, these parasites live in lemur populations throughout the island of Madagascar. So um, we predicted current distributions of the six focal parasites. Um, the, the heat maps here um, indicate the likelihood that a parasite could occur in, in each location based on the underlying environmental um, conditions. So a warmer color indicates that there's a higher likelihood that a parasite could occur in that area based on those environmental conditions. So we did find fairly widespread distributions. So in just looking at surface land area of Madagascar, we found that anywhere from 12 to 26% of, of total land area in Madagascar could potentially host one of these parasites. But more relevant to lemurs is the forested area. And so across that, we saw anywhere from 40 to 86% of forested area um, could, could um, harbor these parasites. <clears throat> 
And so this was a, an estimate of, of where these parasites could occur under current conditions. But we were interested to think, okay, into the future, as these environmental conditions are changing with climate change, how is that going to impact distributions of parasites, and what does that mean for lemur health? And so we then took um, future climate conditions, so in the year 2080, with again that shift in, in more warming and more precipitation, and we modeled the same six focal parasites into the future. And so we were in, really interested to see how that would change. And so um, as you're looking at this map, the, the different colors, so an orange color represents an area where a parasite was present in both current and future um, conditions. So it, there was no change. A, the gray color indicates where a parasite was, pr was absent in both current and future conditions. The two more important colors to focus on are, are blue, so that indicates where there was a contraction of range, so where a parasite was present in current conditions and, and absent in the future. Um, and then red, where we see a parasite was absent in current, but present in the future. So red indicates where parasites will be expanding into new habitats, potentially. And we saw really variable responses from each of these um, parasites, anywhere from uh, a, a contraction of 7% to an expansion of 60%. But on average, we see helmets expanded about 22%, and ectoparasites expanded about 11%. And the, the parasites that had the most pathogenic potential did expand the most. So just looking at one of these um, parasites, this is a cestode that um, is, is, has been documented frequently in lemurs. We know that in humans it can cause um, nausea, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. And interestingly, it has also been documented in rats, so it could be a potential area of interest um, to look at that cross-species uh, transmission. And so we see a contraction in the northeast and then all the way down the, the forested area on the east as well as in the west. So we're seeing quite a lot of expansion. And so this is an example of how climate change may be expected to expand, on, on largely expand, parasite distributions, which I think is important for lemur health and fitness, as well as because it can be transmitted, they, some of them can be transmitted across species, um, it's important to think about lemurs, rodents, domestic animals, and humans. So uh, this was my quick tour, I'm almost out of time, but so we, we explored environmental change in, in Madagascar, how it impacts um, injury in two different sites um, and, and significantly impacted nutrition and immune response and parasite richness, and also um, that based on modeled predictions of how climate change will impact and expand parasite distributions across the country. So again, a plug for, for thinking about these in a more holistic way, thinking about not just lemur as lemurs as hosts, but the interaction between lemurs and domestic animals and humans as well as rodents. And I just wanted to close in thinking that um, environmental change has had a big impact on lemurs in, in Madagascar, but it's important to recognize all of the other organisms like humans that also rely on stable ecosystems and all of the services that they provide. Um, so this was a, a huge team effort and a lot of um, work in my dissertation was, so I thank people in, in Madagascar and at Duke and others, um, and I also thank THB for getting me through field work. <laughs> so that's it, thank you.